In this episode of What's in the Box, we talk to author and paranormal researcher Jay Rice. So stay tuned and see what's in the box. All right, let's welcome Jay Rice to What's in the Box. Jay is a paranormal researcher and an author. Jay, can you tell us how long you have been conducting paranormal research? I've been researching over 25 years. Uh, I've had an interest in it ever since I was a little kid. But uh, actively researching at least 25 years. Since back, I guess, in the early 90s, uh, I don't use all the fancy equipment that some of the other folks use, but uh, I seem to get some pretty good results, you know. And uh, I seem to be able to pick up on on things that other people can. I, I, I can feel spirits. I can hear spirits. Uh, so, I can uh, feel like, you know, like they just walk up to you and, and touch you on the shoulder and such as that. You know, I, I can pick up on things like that that other people can't. So that's a plus, too, in the investigation part. So uh, you're kind of uh, empathic. Right. Okay, yeah, I'm sure that comes in handy. And uh, I, at times uh, I've heard other people who are empaths speak about how difficult it is because you feel the emotions associated oh with that energy you you don't want to get out in big crowds and uh you know you just don't want to be around a lot of people because you pick up on everything well so i try to i try to avoid i try to avoid places like the malls and places like that as much as i can because you just pick up on everything well, let me ask you this uh, about your paranormal research. What is the most haunted location that you've been into? Uh, actually, my own house. The one you currently live in? Yes. Oh, a lot of activity. Uh, yes, it's uh, when uh, it all started when uh, my dad passed away. And uh, it was, this is my old home place where I live now. And the night that my dad passed away, he told me just before he died that he wanted to go home one more time. And when he passed and we got everything settled at the hospital and made it back home, there was a smell of cedar in the house. I, I, it was so strong that I couldn't breathe. I had to go back outside. And the key to that was my dad worked for Lane Furniture for 40 some years and made cedar chests. And I remember as a kid when he would come home that he smelled like cedar and glue. And that smell that night when I came into the house was that cedar and glue smell. And it lasted about, I'd say, 10 minutes and it faded away. And I asked my other family members, my brother, my mother and all, did they smell anything? And they said, no, they didn't smell a thing. Wow. So that, that told me right there that he got to come home one more time. And after that, uh, I could hear him walking through the house. He had a distinct walk. He, he had polio when he was a kid. And one of his legs was shorter than the other, and he wore a shoe that was, the heel was built up, and it was a brace on that leg, which made it heavy, and he sort of drug that foot. So I could tell it was his footsteps, you know. And uh, I would say thanks to my mother. I, I was staying with her at the time, so she could, I guess, get, get used to living alone, you know, without him here. And I would say thanks to her about, you know, hearing him in the house. And she was just, you know, she was brushing off as nothing that I was just imagining. But about two weeks after he passed, 
she woke up one night and felt a hand on her back. She said it scared her, and she was scared to turn over and see what it was. But finally she said she got up the carriage to, to roll over and look, and there was nothing there. Well, she said she laid there and thought about it for a few minutes, and then she felt somebody sit down on the foot of the bed. And uh, when she said whatever it was got up, she got up. She went running through the house, cutting every light on, screaming at the top of her lungs, woke me up. I went running to see what was going on. And uh, that's what she told me, that uh, somebody had sat on the bed and somebody had put their hand on her back. Well, this happened two or three times within about a week's time. And uh, she started telling me that the bed was haunted and she sold her bed and got her a new one and it never happened again. Hmm. You know, but, we, we uh, lived in a haunted house that we that that happened in the house that we lived in something would sit on the bed which i always thought my grandmother but it happened almost every night that something would sit on the bed it would actually depress the bed you know you could see it pushed down but it didn't it didn't really scare us because we always thought it was my grandmother right i you know this didn't bother me i mean it, it kind of upset my mother but uh it didn't bother me I, I knew who it was and uh that was that was one of his nightly rituals Every night before he'd go to bed, he would sit on the foot of that bed for five or ten minutes before he'd lay down. That was just something he did every night. So, you know, I knew it was him. Have uh, you have you attempted to make contact with him uh, in the house? I have not, but I had a psychic to uh, come in and uh, actually got some information uh, that it was him and that he was doing well and that he actually had one of my dogs with him. The little dog I had as a child. Well, I think it would be interesting to uh, run a spirit box or something like that. You may be able to actually hear his voice or something. It, it would be. I, I've got that in mind. As soon as I get some other things straightened out that I'm working on now, I'm, I've got intentions on, on doing something like that. Well, uh, I'm gonna, let's get off into your uh, your books. I know you've wrote several books. Uh, tell us what's your first book you, you wrote, and uh, tell us what got you interested in writing, uh, specifically, what just got you into wanting to write books. All right, the first one is uh, True Stor Short Stories of the Paranormal, My Personal Experiences. And it tells about things that I've, seen and heard and ran across over the years like my dad passing away uh my mom passing away uh some stories that my grandmother had told uh there's a few stories in there that a friend of mine has uh told me and actually one story in there uh we actually experienced together my friend and i uh, we were in his house one night, and uh, this lady, little little short gray-haired lady in a gray dress, went walking through his kitchen, and we saw it through the uh, reflection in the window. And uh, kind of unnerved us both at the time, but uh, after we got up and searched around and sort of figured out what it was, it, you know, it wasn't too bad after that. <laughs> That was, it's shocking when you first see something like that, especially if you're not expecting it. I mean, if you're out on a, if you're out on a ghost hunt or something, you kind of you're kind of prepared to see something. But if you're just in your house eating, you know, dinner or supper, and then something walks through, it's it's, it's pretty startling. Yeah, I, I hadn't been there but maybe 15 minutes, and we sat down, was watching some TV. He was waiting on his wife to get home from work, and uh, we were just sitting there talking and watching TV, and I happened to see that little old lady go across the kitchen in a, in a reflection in the window and I looked over at him and he was looking at me he saw it too <laughs> and uh, he he was kind of upset about it because things like that just don't sit well with him and uh, we finally got up and checked out everything and saw that it you know it wasn't anybody there but he talked to his father-in-law the next day 
which he rents that house, well, rented the house then from his father-in-law. And he said that it was his aunt is who it was that she had died in that house. Oh. And when uh, we described the little lady to him, he said, yeah, he said, that sounds exactly like my aunt. Okay, so, and, th and this story is in your, in your first book that you wrote? Yes, it's in there. Okay, and what inspired you to write this book? I've been saving notes and stuff over the years, and uh, I've always wanted to write a book. I just, I don't know, it's just something about it that intrigued me, and I just always said that I wanted to write one book. And like I said, I've been keeping notes and stuff in the, in the back of my mind and writing little things down here and there. To, and I always said that I was going to save it for retirement. That's what I was going to do after I retired. But it just kind of got the best of me. I was, you know, I need to go on and do this and, and get it out there, you know, so people can read it. Well, have you had a pretty good response from, uh, from readers? I have. Uh, Pretty good so far. I've got uh, about four and a half stars on my reviews on Amazon, so I think that's I think it's pretty good. That's very good. Uh, I know uh, my first book that I wrote. I've, I've got some pretty good reviews on it, and I know there's some errors in it. It seemed like for me, I, I'm pressed for time a lot, and sometimes I rush. And well, that's that's a lot of my problem too. And you know, a lot of times you need to go back. What well, people a lot of times don't realize. By the time your book is published, you've actually read that book multiple, multiple, multiple times. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to skim over a, a small spelling error or, or a word that's out of place or something. It's the same way with, same way with editing video. By the time a, a movie comes out, uh, I've probably watched that movie 20 times. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to let something slip through. So I'm yeah, sure that probably I, happened I, to you too. Uh, absolutely. I, I should have given this first book a lot more time but it was just i guess the excitement of it i wanted to get it out there so i'm paying closer attention to the the following books that i've i've done and the uh, one i'm working on now okay tell and, us uh, tell us about your your second book it's uh the adventures of pete johnson and the hairy ones it's just some uh short fictional stories about a guy that uh meets up with a Bigfoot type creature and through the stories near the end of the book he, he finally befriends this this creature and uh, it tells little stories about how he first met how he first saw this this uh, creature and uh, different just different little stories about you know different things that uh, he's done how he started uh, feeding them and uh different places that he saw them and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good reading I mean it's, it's a book that's for young and old alike and I've actually got this book in a couple of uh, school libraries now oh that's good uh, uh, one in particular the, it's a middle school library uh, the principal there wants me to come and uh have a talk with the kids and tell them a few stories and tell them all about my books and stuff. So it's going to be that's going to be pretty enjoyable and pretty interesting. That sounds like it would be fun. Uh, the books are based around the character you call Pete Johnson. Yes. What? All the stories are around this one character, Pete Johnson. Okay, tell us a little bit about Pete Johnson. What kind of guy is he? What in, in your mind? What kind of character is Pete Johnson? Well, he kind of reminds me of myself. He's kind of laid back, easygoing guy, and he's interested in the paranormal and uh, uh, cryptids, and he he loves to get outside and fish and hunt and camp and all sorts of things like that. And uh, lives in a old log home, log cabin, back on a little farm. He's got a few animals and. He uh, just lives a good life. Just kind of a good and, old boy. Yeah, exactly. I, it, it's kind of, I kind of sort of loosely base it on me. Hey. <laughs> well, now uh, my understanding that there's uh, there's going there's more Pete Johnson books, and I know there's a number two book that just came out. Tell us a little bit about it and what what the premise of it is. 
Alright, uh, the next one is called The Adventures of Pete Johnson and the Ghosts of Scott's Mount. It's just some uh, paranormal type stories uh, that are based around the area where Pete lives and uh, uh, the Scott's Mountain is actually a real place here. I can look out my kitchen window and see Scott's Mountain. So I was kind of based the mountain on that. And uh, there was some folks that lived up on the mountain there that uh, had some troubles and they all passed away. And now Pete Hilo used to love to hike that mountain. And when he goes through there every once in a while, he can hear kids giggling, laughing, or he can see the old lady that lived there. He can see her through a window, uh, you know, just little apparitions. Uh, Another one of the stories is uh, one called uh, The Ghost of, uh, let's see, I can't remember the name of it now. It's Peyton's Ghost. That's what it is. Uh, and that's sort of loosely based on a friend of mine that passed away a few years ago. And I kind of sort of based that on his life, how, you know, his uh, family, his kids and all. Just I just changed names and such as that. So uh, a little bit rooted in truth. Right, it's uh, what I do, I, I pick places I've been, people I know, and things like that, and I sort of use that character, but I'll change names and such as that. So what I like to call it is faction. It's part fact, part fiction. You know, it, it, uh, it's... A lot of the places are based on real places, but like I said, names are changed and people's names are changed. And I just use uh, like you know their their character and stuff. You know, you know how they acted, how they talked, such as that. You know, right? Uh, people we meet in our life, uh, a lot of them have uh, personalities that stick with us over time. I mean, the certain way they do yeah. things or way the reactions and things. It just sticks with you. Certain people do. Exactly. I, growing up as a kid, well, on up as a teenager in the early 20s or so, I hung around more older people than I did people my age. And I learned a lot from those people. And like I said, those, those people, things they taught me, things they told me, have stuck with me over the years. And uh, I could be writing part of a story for one of these books and just something one of those people told me pops in my head and I'll turn it around a little bit to where I can use it in that book. Hmm. That's interesting. You're talking about hanging around the older folk. I know when I was young, uh, I was old, you know, old enough to drive and things like that. I was probably 16, 17 year old. I would go to our local mall and a lot of times I'd sit over and talk to the old men because they had the best stories. <laughs> exactly. There was an old country store. Uh, about, I say about 12 miles from here, back up in the country. And I went up there every chance I'd get because it would be a bunch sitting around the old pot belly stove there and telling stories and stuff from back up in the mountains. And, and it was always something interesting being told, you know. Right. And I learned I learned a lot from those old people and, and I thought the world of that, the guy that ran the store, he was a, he was a mighty fine man. And, uh, yeah, I used, to, I used to love to go up there and hang around some, you know, when I was younger. Uh, now, That's, back to the Pete Johnson storyline, uh, the books, uh, it's my understanding that there's uh, you're working on a third book based on the Pete Johnson character? It is. Uh, it's called, uh, it's going to be called Grandma's Front Porch. And this is actually... Uh, Pete Johnson as, a, as a, a small boy, about eight or nine years old, and he visits his grandmother every day, and they'll sit out on the old front porch, and she'll tell him stories about how she grew up and how uh, she lived her life poor and, and growing up with nothing, and on through when she got married and had kids, and on up until, actually on up until the day she passed away. 
Well, one thing about your books, is, from what I understand, is that uh, you do gear them that anybody can read them. There's no uh, profanity and stuff like that in them or any scenes that would be, uh, you know, controversial. Uh, no, I, I, I don't believe in that. I, for one thing, see, I work for uh, the county school system, and I, I love to read myself, and I want to be able to have something out there that uh, interests kids, you know, and I, I know for a fact in a lot of the schools that I, I worked in that the kids love things like ghost stories and uh, Bigfoot and, and the Loch Ness Monster and stuff like that. And I want something that will interest these kids to get them to read more. And uh, like I said, I, I, I do this for the kids, but it's an interest to the, the grown-ups as well, you know, the little stories. Yeah, now I've I've read uh, several of your books and I, I I liked them. I enjoyed them. They're uh, they're like I say, in, like you say, and anybody can pick them up and read them, and don't have to worry about a bunch of uh, vulgarities or anything like that in the book. And uh, it's just something I enjoy doing. I can sit down, my mind will be completely blank, and I can sit down with a notebook and especially I, I go out I go outside days when it's warm and you know pretty pleasant out there I'll sit out at my picnic table and uh, I'll just pick that pencil up and just start writing and it just it just comes to me you know and then when it when it goes away I just put everything up and and go on about my business and then I'll think of something else and I'll go sit down and I'll write a few more pages that's the best way to do it really I mean I, I'm, I'm like you when the inspiration there it's easy to write but when it's not, it's a struggle, and then you can't careful, you get frustrated, so you're better off going to find you something else to do for a little while. I had actually started another book uh, before Grandma's Front Porch. I had started one called The Haunting of Chalk Creek, and had gotten several chapters written on it. And uh, I went out there one day and sat down at my picnic table and was gonna work on that book, and this other story just came to me you know, about uh, Pete and his grandmother. And I said, well, let me see here. And I started writing some stuff down. And uh, from from that day on, I started working on that. I have about, I think it's 10 chapters so far written in that book. Well, do you, and, uh, do you think you'll bring that book out this year? Uh, yes, I, I'm hoping to. I'm, I'm probably almost halfway through it. And... Uh, once I once I finish, I like like you said, I'll go back over it ten or fifteen times and uh, edit it and such as that before it ever come out. But I'm I'm almost positive it'll be out this year. Well, that'd be good. Uh, for people who may not know, where can they find your books at? Where can they purchase these books at? Uh, they can purchase them on uh, Amazon. They can purchase them on, uh, I think they can get them on your website as well, can't they? Uh, uh, I, yeah, I think we got some links and stuff on some of our uh, some of our websites. And uh, my Facebook page, uh, if anybody wants wants one, I can uh, show them where to go. Or a matter of fact, I think I have a few here. If uh, they'd like to purchase it from me, I'll, I'll sign a copy for them. Uh, just uh, look up uh, Jay Rice on uh, Facebook and just give me a shout. And it's uh, also I, I noticed that on Amazon it is available in an ebook for those who maybe want to take it on the go with them and not actually take a book but have it on their phone or tablet or something like that. So yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I used to say that I'd rather have a book in my hand to hold and read, but I tell you what, those ebooks are really convenient. You can you can take them almost anywhere and take up no space. Yeah, and, that's true, and it's uh, very convenient if you're traveling or something, and you you know you don't want to leave your book at the hotel room, but if you got you're not going to leave your phone, most likely you're going to hang on to it. Exactly. Uh, but Jay, I sure appreciate you being a guest today on What's in the Box, and uh, and it's great to hear about what you're working on and some of the past projects that you've uh, that you've done. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us or uh, inform us about? Uh, well, there was uh, a sighting that uh, happened, uh, I guess it's been eight, 
nine months ago now, I was on my way from work one afternoon, and uh, I saw, you know, this little small field down in the bottom of a hollow over to the left, and there was a tall, some type of creature. I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it looked like it was seven or eight feet tall. A sort of a cinnamon red color standing in the middle of that field. Well, just uh, a few weeks ago, a good friend of mine saw something cross the road right there in the same spot that uh, was about seven or eight feet tall, but it, he said it was a little darker brown than what I saw, but it took two steps and crossed the road and was gone. So we so, think this is a, probably a Bigfoot? Uh, it's a good possibility because uh, I can't think of anything else that would come down. It's a pretty steep uh, bank there on, on the left-hand side of the road, and it came off of that bank, made two steps, went over the guardrail, and was gone. And I can't think of anything else that would come down on two legs like that and cross the road in two steps. And there's good so, uh, good food sources and water sources in that area? There's a, there's a small creek that runs right along the side of the road there, and uh, there's... Uh, cattle in one field, there's sheep in one field, llamas, uh, there's a guy that's got some chickens up there, all through that little stretch of road. So there is a good food source and there's also turkey, deer, and such as that I see a lot in there. It sounds like a, like a Bigfoot supermarket. It, it does, yeah. You take your and pick. Uh, and well, like I said, one side of the road is mostly farmland, but the other side of the road is all wooded. So, well, that's, know, that's a, a good place for them to hang out. Yeah, that's a good uh, good possibility with all those food sources and a water source. You know, that's any creature, humans included, we've got to have water and food, you know, and shelter. That's the three big things for us. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure Bigfoot's and, uh, the same way. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's more to it than a lot of people want to want to admit to I, I, I know there's something out there I, I know it is I mean I, I've seen too many things I've heard too many things to not believe it well it's, it's I can confirm that I've seen them too and I've tracked them for years and it, there's definitely something to it it shouldn't be dismissed so easily by people because there's definitely something to it you know I've, I've, I've seen them well I've heard them follow me through the woods and know it was something besides a deer or a bear or, you know, something like that. It was a bipedal creature. It uh, would follow me all through these woods, and like, well, which was my grandmother's home place, and it was about 900 acres in there, and I used to roam that place as a kid. I mean, I was all over it. And many times I've had something follow me. And uh, I've heard stories that my grandmother told about something she called shiny eyes. Uh, She would see something sort of skirting around the edge of the woods right inside the tree line around her house at night with big bright shiny red eyes. And uh, I mean, she she was the type of person that uh, she wasn't going to tell you a lie. I mean, if she saw something, she saw something. And uh, she used to, my, my mom would tell me she used to talk about that quite often, about seeing something's eyes out there. And uh, she said whatever it was, it was big. You know, she never said how tall or anything like that, but she said whatever it was, was big. Well, that's the thing about uh, the older generation. They're, they didn't actually... Uh kid around much they didn't that was pretty serious life was different back then it was harder back then so they didn't have a whole lot of joking around like we do nowadays exactly exactly they told you they saw something they was being serious they wasn't just trying to make something up to uh you know make a joke or whatever yeah and uh some people say they they smell that awful smell and stuff like that before sighting and I, I have been through all those woods down there and never smelled a thing. And then on two occasions within three weeks apart, I smelled that putrid 
rotten meat and musky type smell. And uh, the first time I didn't hear anything or see anything. But uh, about three weeks later, I smelled it. I mean, it was, it was like it was right on my back porch. And uh, I went out and looked around and I could hear footsteps going through the woods. It sounded like something on two legs walking, but never saw a thing, never saw a leaf move. Hmm. Well, now, you know, I've, I've done a lot of Bigfoot research over the year, and I've been in close proximity of them many times. And, you know, I've never actually say for 100% fact I've ever smelt one. Well, like I said, I, I, I think that's an odor that they can produce at will. Kind of a defensive type yeah. thing, maybe? Sort of like a sort of like a skunk. Mm. You know, it may be a warning or something like that. You know, you smell that, you won't come around. But uh, like I said, I've I've smelled those two times, and they were within about three weeks. But that's the only time I've ever smelled anything. Uh, the rest of the times, I've I've never detected a smell. Just just heard them, and I've heard them close by and stopped and and just stared, looked and watched and never saw a twig move or anything, but I could hear them walking. You know, so they're they're good at keeping the cover, that's for sure. They're very stealthy, that's for sure. Yes indeed. But uh, you know, I maybe talking about how they smell, I guess, you know, maybe they're kinda of like people in a, in a lot of ways. Sometimes we run into people who don't smell so pleasant. Well, uh, that's for whatever that's reason. That's I mean, you know, you can find one that's close to a river or something and they cross in that river all the time. You know, I guess you could say, well, every time they cross that river, they get a bath. Well, and, uh, uh, actually, but, I, I, my neighbor, my neighbor actually seen one in the creek a few years back. Uh, he said he didn't know what it was doing. It was kind of splashing around, which I don't know if it may have been trying to catch a fish or maybe it was just playing in the water or bathing or whatever. So, But he, they looked at each yeah. other and it took off in the mountains and he took off the other way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think the, the, the more they they stay in the water and all, you know, I think maybe the, you know it could be the, the less you smell them. You just you, you just don't know. I mean, that's the thing. There's a whole lot we don't don't know or understand about them, but uh, that's why we got to research and tell our stories and things like that. It, it is, and it sure is interesting. Sure is. I mean, it's just the more I talk about it, the more I hear about it, the more I read about it the more intrigued I am about the whole the whole thing. And it's just it's just something that's that grabbed me as a kid and I've been in, interested in it ever since. Uh Jay, do you actually uh still do uh, paranormal research and stuff for other people? Uh when I when I have a chance. When I you do. have time. Okay. I did are, are, is there a website that people could uh, contact you or should they just use your Facebook page? Well, just Facebook page for right now. Uh, I am currently working on the website, but I haven't, I haven't got anything up and going yet. And that's time so, consuming uh, too. So, yeah. So uh, I've, I've been going through some health problems too, and I'm trying to get all of that situated and get everything going. You know, with with my health and get back to doing some things that I want to do. I, I have actually talked to some people about uh, doing a uh, an investigation in an old museum here. It was uh, an old three-story house that was built back in the 1700s and uh, it's been turned into a museum. And uh, a friend of mine has been talking to the uh, guy that takes care of the place now and he wants us to come in sometime and, and do some research. So that's going to be a really interesting uh, investigation there in that, in that old place. Yeah, that might, that might be it, some fun. Yes, indeed. I, I can't wait to get in there. So as, as soon as I can get my health straightened out and uh, get uh, a couple of uh, my other teammates back together again. One of them was apparently living in West Virginia now, so as soon as I can get her back down here, and uh, uh, one of the other ladies that uh, helps me some, we can all get together, and we're going to go in there and see what we can find. 
Well, you have to keep us informed on if, uh, what activity you capture. Oh, I sure will. I sure will. Well, Jay, it's been a pleasure talking to you today, and we appreciate you coming on uh, on the show. And well, uh, I, I've enjoyed it. And maybe we can do it again on down the road. Uh, maybe when the next book comes out, we can have you back on and let you tell us a little more about it and things oh, like absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely, I'd love to. But uh, for now, we'll 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 call it uh, call it the show, and and uh, I'll talk to you in the near future. All right, sounds good. I've enjoyed it. All right, thanks, Jay. Hey, thank you. Thanks for listening to the show today. If you have a comment or a suggestion, please send us a message. If you have a topic you'd like to hear us talk about or a person maybe you would like for us to interview uh, or a story to tell, please send us a message. Thanks.